Welcome to Exhibition. And hello, Paul Connor. Hello, Richard. Uh, thanks for having me on. Great to see you. Lovely to have you here. Um, and your exhibition is Protest Paintings at Art Atrium in Sydney. Um, and take us to that title, first of all, uh, because perhaps in many people's minds, the word protest is associated with some sort of street demonstration or some sort of angry protest. But is that what this exhibition is? I don't think so. Well, <laughs> it's not angry, although I can be angry. No, I'm not angry. Um, well, I am a bit. Um, look, uh, protest is uh, um, the definition, the Latin definition of protest test, um, is um, a public advocacy for something. Really, it's, it's a public advocacy. And it was borrowed from an article I read in the Sydney Morning Herald, that definition. I really liked it because um, it, it spoke to me of a kind of um, uh, influencer that landscape architect, that landscape uh, painting can be. It can influence the way we think, um, especially on plein air painting. Um, it's immediacy and the journey you have to make to do it can advocate for this incredible natural world in which we live. You would see, from what you're saying there, you would see the works in this exhibition as, as advocating for a way of seeing the landscape. Is, is that correct? And, correct, and, and to engage with it. I think if, if we advocate for it as landscape artists, people will hopefully engage more with it and see the benefit in keeping it. And um, I guess that gets back to the protest in that um, there is a need to reconnect to our natural world. And I think the best way I can do that is by painting it and trying to advocate uh, and influence people. So in terms of, uh, of the range of these works, and there is uh, quite a range of different approaches to representing the landscape or your interaction with the landscape in these works. Um, what is it that you hope uh, a viewer or a visitor to this exhibition will go away thinking about their relationship with the landscape? Oh, um, I, I think just that sense of um, wanting to personally engage, maybe personally engage in the landscape, but also wanting to paint. I mean, we're we're, we're the lucky ones that can can still you know dance or sing or paint. I can't do the, the first two. Uh, <laughs> I never have been able to do them. Uh, but um, I think also the love of making marks for anybody and everybody. So there's there's two things I really is um, the love of drawing and the love of our environment, our natural environment for the moment. You know. Well, the place uh, and the circumstance under which you get to draw or paint uh, in the environment is very often en plein air. You are working in the environment, capturing that environment. Uh, tell us why for you working on plein air is so important and, and how do you go about it? I guess some of us can't afford or find easily big spaces in the inner city. So, what does that mean? You end up going outside. And of course, we've got the most conducive um, climate for doing so um, and compelling um, environment. Of course, with children, as um, artists often find themselves, you know, it's, it's kind of fun to go out with them and paint and, and they play. And of course, they've grown up now, so they don't do so much. But um, I think circumstance drove me to painting on plan air. And I think it does a lot of people, a lot of artists. Give us a little bit of a sense of, of what you do when you're painting plein air. And I, I, uh, I think you may have part of your plein air equipment just nearby. Oh. <laughs> can, can, you, can you introduce us and, and just, just tell us what that experience is like for you? Okay, well, look, there's two things, really important things with on plein air painting. You've got to find a good subject. But probably more important than that is it's got to be comfortable because you're going to be there a long time. <laughs> so what I haven't got is my chair, a collection of chairs and stools. Mm. Uh, but what I do have is my rather small painting kit. And I mean, there's nothing special about it except its size, which means I can put it in a backpack. And it's, it's kind of got everything you need, including um, brushes and, um, 
and bowls and planks and inks and so forth. But importantly, you can clip on, um, and I've got a clip there, but I won't show you that, um, the, the, the picture plane. And in fact, some of the picture planes are, are much larger than that, but you can clip onto it. So that all fits into a very small backpack. So it means I can get to places like North Head and down the cliff um, with my lunch and my, my comfortable chair. <laughs> and that's, I think, the most important thing, really. Not only has it got to be a great subject, you know, and a good composition, right lights, but it's fine, it has to be comfortable. There are different um, environments depicted in the works in this exhibition. Uh, you mentioned uh, the cliffs of, uh, of Sydney and Sydney Harbour, and we certainly see quite a number of, of those, so relatively uh, close by to where you might uh, be living or have access to. There is also uh, some wonderful um, Australian outback or central Australian landscape. Um, and there are also some very um, city focused uh, and very different artworks. Can you take us through those three different types and why you've chosen to portray them in the way you have? Uh, yeah, look, the, um, they're also three different, very, very different mediums used. Um, and uh, are, are mostly I are painted with gouache because it's very transportable. And um, I can paint quite large pictures um, in, in gouache and then cold wax them. Uh, that's a fairly safe thing for me because I've, I've used gouache all the time. So when I go to somewhere very different, like uh, Ross River, north of Alice Springs, I'll use gouache um, more successfully. Uh, I've started using acrylic because the standard of acrylic is so good now. But of course, acrylic dries very quickly. So you don't get that, you can't blur the edges and you know, it doesn't accept mistakes. So, and also, I, um, so you can layer it, of course. So I use ink over it. Uh, and basically I redraw the picture. So that's, they, they end up quite different looking as a result of the medium and the process of, of, of getting it in result. The, the final one, the city images are drawn on an iPad. And um, that's quite handy because, you know, if you set up in the city, you're on plein air painting kit, people will come over and ask you what you're doing. And sometimes <laughs> I've been annoyed enough to say to people, I'm actually doing my tax return, you know? It's like, of course I'm paying, you know? <laughs> you know? But I'm not a public event. Whereas an iPad, people won't bother you, you know? People won't bother somebody on a computer. How much uh, is the, the medium that you choose to use reflective of, in some ways, your relationship with the, the environment that you are in? You know, the iPad seems perhaps more of a, a city-based tool. Uh, the, the relatively familiar and accessible rocks and cliffs and, and uh, trees and botanic gardens are more delineated with the, the ink and the acrylic. And then when you're in that much wilder, less accessible country, you seem suddenly to become much looser. Are you aware of those shifts in your frame of mind or frame of perception? No, because they just come naturally. Um, until um, John McDonald wrote uh, his, his catalogue essay. And I said to John, um, now I understand what I'm doing. And he said, you'd be surprised how many artists say that am I write about them. And, and so the, the answer is not, not really, no, um, uh, but I'm lucky enough to have a suite of um, kits and, mm. and approaches. So those, those are choices for you. It's interesting that you mentioned the, uh, the essay by John MacDonald um, uh, in the catalogue, uh, because he referenced um, Philip Guston uh, yeah. in relation to some of the works um, and other, uh, and other uh, painters. But how important for you are those senses of connection with art history and, and with, with other influential artists? Oh, tremendously. I mean, I think that one of the great things about painting is it engages you with other art and, it, you know, uh, great pictures are, are just an absolute thrill to see. And, you know, they surprise you. Um, you know, and then you, you see the excellent, extraordinary Phil Guston we have at the, the um, New South Wales Art Gallery. I mean, it's a great thing about painting is you get to understand paintings. And, of course, 
you get thrilled by the way. And you know, Philip Guston's hard edges or um, kooky stuff. Um, I mean, it's not entirely hard edges, but his cartoon characters have an edge mm. to them. Um, you know, of course, taught me a bit when I came across acrylics. Take us back into uh, the landscape, whatever uh, landscape it is that you are in and deciding to capture. And can you give us a sense of what you look for in the landscape? You know, we see a work um, uh, with, with a tumble of rocks or trees or a building or an outback scene, but what are you looking for and why have you chosen that? Usually it's a really good composition. You know, just walking around till you see a really lovely composition of things. Now, this this painting here is a composition made in the studio. It's quite unusual for me, but it's a composition of whole different elements. Um, and you can do that in the studio, but you can't do that outside. You've got to find a composition that that is going to work in your painting. So I'm looking for that. I'm looking for a comfortable spot uh, out of the wind with the sun in the right spot. So it can take quite a while. You mentioned quite a while. And the other thing that can take quite a while on a much longer scale is, is the evolution of an artist. Uh, and, in, and in many ways, um, your approach to representing the landscape has evolved in, in all sorts of iterations over the years. Uh, how, how would you describe that journey? And, and how does that evolution feel to you? Oh, look, it's, it's you know, it's, I don't understand people who find themselves early. I mean, I'm good on them. I mean, I'd love to have done that. And of course, I'm interested in architecture too. So that's taken the division. But I'm also interested in building boats, you know, build, uh, and building things. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not, I, so I spend time away from painting. So when you come back, you find, and you might have seen a new artist or just thought about something whilst you're building a boat, or you learn things. And of course, as a human, you evolve. And um, an invention is, is, is one of the things that I think as a child, children are wonderfully inventive. And if you can maintain that as an adult, your life's pretty fun. You've been a finalist in quite a number of national art prizes over the years. In fact, um, two of the works in this exhibition were finalists in the Paddington Art Prize, one of the, the country's major landscape uh, prizes, um, and other works in the exhibition have been finalists in other significant prizes as well. What do you think about the importance of art prizes and, and again, the growth in that phenomenon in recent years? Well, when I started the On Plain Air Painting Prize at Parliament House, I was asked about it and I said, look, well, the last thing the world needs is another art prize. Well, you know, I started one. <laughs> and, um, look, um, I entered that and I entered a few others, um, but it was really a Simon uh, Chanmai um, the gallery director, my gallery director, who said, look, at the end of the day, that's the way people see pictures now. And you really should enter them. So last two years, I've, I've entered them. And, um, and it's great, you know, you get paintings um, shown in the regional galleries. And, and um, I guess people engage with that. And that's what you want. It is, uh, I think, like so many things, if you're cynical about it, as I might have been, um, you don't see the benefit. And the benefit is people looking at paintings. Now, they might choose the right paintings and they might choose the wrong winner, but um, there's a lot of good paintings out there, a lot of good paintings. Going back to um, some of the iPad works, which are very much uh, your observations of the, the built environment and often the city built environment. Um, how have your art and architecture practices spoken to each other over the years? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that because, and recognise that as something. So many people are, suggest that, oh, I'm doing painting now or, and now you're doing architecture. But, you know, they interrelate so much and they do speak to one another. Um, I learned to draw um, in architecture faculty. I always drew. I love drawing. I love inventing things. But I learned the craft in the tin sheds and um, studying uh, Renaissance, Baroque and Renaissance architecture. And then I traveled and like all architects, you take a, 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 a visual diary and you draw. And um, I didn't take a camera and I just drew for a year. You know, <laughs> got to the stage that Jeannie, my wife would say, can you just uh, draw that over there? You know, as if I was taking a photograph. So, you know, you build your craft, but all architects draw and, and most paint, most stop, unfortunately, 
because they take the role of an architect, you know. But we're in the visual world, architects and artists. They happily coexist. One informs the other. I can't imagine that I'm not looking at architecture when I'm drawing in the iPad, you know, the iPad. And I can't imagine that whilst I'm drawing a house, I'm not thinking of, of the sun and where the wind's coming from, the trees and how they're leaning and the, the fall of the land and all the things you're thinking about when you're painting. I can't imagine they're separate. As you have described to us, sitting in the landscape, painting on plein air, using whatever medium is appropriate, what you end up with does protest your view of the landscape and invite others to share it. So, Paul Connor, thanks very much for sharing your exhibition with us. Thank you very much, Richard, for your interest.